Good to see you guys today. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm your campus pastor, and we hope you feel at home here at River Oaks and Elkhart. What a great time of worship, right? Man, God is good. It's exactly what we're going to be doing in heaven, worshiping God Almighty, who is worthy of all that praise. It's so important we understand that. But real quick, I want to just jump back into what we're doing, guys. This is uh, one of the last Sundays we will be here in this building. I, I got to keep telling you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to keep reminding you that because I don't want you to show up here in the next couple weeks and wonder, man, what happened to the church? Everybody's gone. No, we're downtown on 5th and Franklin Street. All right. We're going to be there. Yep, yep. There won't be any snow right this time of year. So that's <laughs> praise. Oh, man, hope, hope God, please, we're praying. Right? This is Indiana, though. You know, that, that could be in June. Who knows? But anyway, we're just, I am so excited. I was looking back at some pictures that we had like four or five years ago when we first kicked off stuff. It's just amazing how faithful God has been throughout this entire process, man. And I'm, I'm just so excited uh, to move into this facility and just really see what God's going to do. But I'm going to tell you, when we move here, it's going to bring its own set of challenges. All right? We will not be in a thousand-seat auditorium. Okay? It'll probably seat 250 to 300. We're going to have to figure out parking. There won't be a huge, massive parking lot. We'll have to park across the street at the funeral home, or right around the corner, around the street. All these are things that come with being a church downtown. We won't be at a school anymore. We'll be in a church that's in a neighborhood. So there'll be people walking their dogs, sitting on the porch, hanging out. So you got to understand, that's what we're here to do, okay? There will be, there is, it's a whole different feel, but that's what we're here to do. I'm excited for that. Uh, that's why we planted this campus, guys. We planted this church to advance the kingdom of God in our city to all people. That, that, that's why we planted this campus to see people from every culture, every economic status become fully devoted followers of Jesus who go, grow, and show. That's why we planted this campus. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Guys, I want to just remind you, that's, that's important that we have that in mind. We want to see homeless people and people who live in the condos come to know Jesus. We want to see people who are drug dealers and people who work at City Hall all come together to become followers of Christ. There's no reason why the church should be able to do that. We want to see, guys, we want our church to look like what, what, what our community looks like, what, what the new heaven and the new earth is going to look like, all God's people together as one. And that's, that's our plan for this church. That's our plan, what we're trying to do. Guys, I, I'll tell you, that's not an easy thing to do. It's easy to talk about it. But let me tell you, it is not easy bringing people together, especially in 2023, with all the political division, the racial division, the tensions. E uh, economic division, all these things that have impacted the church negatively. So bringing Christians together from all walks of life, it will not be easy because guess what? People are messy. Maybe you don't know that. <laughs> but okay, okay. <laughs> I'm right with you. Like we all, we're, we're all messy. You open up anybody's closet, okay? There's things nobody wants to see. We're all messy. We all need the grace and mercy of God, don't we? Yeah. And when we go downtown, we're all going to need that. We're all going to have to understand that it's so important that we get that. But we're here to advance God's kingdom in our city, and that excites you like it excites me, then I'm glad you're here. Guys, I'm going to tell you, don't expect perfection. Okay, please don't. There's going to be a lot of things we're going to have to still. There's probably going to be some outlets we're still going to have to put in. There's probably some more paint we're going to have to put in places. We're going to have to figure things out. That's why we're going to have these first soft launch Sundays to figure it all out. So don't expect perfection, but be patient with us. Now, if you are looking for a place to serve, we had our volunteer fair last week. Thank you guys for signing up for that. If you have not gotten a, a, a call back or a connection with one of our uh, ministry leaders, you will in the next week or so, uh, let us know. We don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. Guys, it's going to take all of us to make this church work. Amen? It's going to take all of us, all hands on deck. So that's, I'm glad you signed up. If you want to continue to sign up, you can stop by the lobby and, and check that out. But I do want to remind you, I should have told you this last week, but I do want to tell you that there are places where you volunteer where there is another level of accountability for you. So if you are an elder or a deacon, or the, that is the highest level of leadership for our church, you go through a process. We just do not just appoint people in those positions. You go through rigorous interviews. We interview your spouse. We talk about your life. You know, we dive deep because th these are the highest leaders in our church who volunteer. If you uh, teach our kids and our students, we don't just let anybody teach our kids. We just don't let anybody get on stage and lead us in worship. We just don't let anybody lead a community groups. There is another level of accountability that comes with those areas. Some of those areas that I mentioned, you might have to have a background check. You might have to go through um, an audition for worship. The, the, all that comes with it. Guys, I want to tell you something. 
I take my job very seriously as a pastor, okay, very seriously. So what I do, I, I, there should be people holding us accountable for a higher standard when we're in, in, uh, in, in positions like this. We have people sign leadership affirmation documents that say, if you're leading the church, if you're out front, realize that you don't just represent yourself, you represent God. Amen. And you represent the church on social media, at home, wherever you're at. Right. That's all a part of leading in the church and being in those positions. When you go to the doctor, I hope <laughs> that my doctor is, has some kind of qualifications. When I, when I give my money to an accountant, I hope somebody is keeping him accountable and there are people who have checked out his life. It's the same thing true in ministry. So in different places where you, where you might serve, uh, whether it's in our kids' area, whether it's in our students, whether it's uh, here on stage, you will go through a process. That's important. Now, we're not looking for perfect people, but we're looking for people we can trust. It's very, very important. So know that. That might be part of, of what you do when you sign up, but there's a place for everybody to serve. So if this is your first time here, we're in the middle of a series called Apocalypse. We are unpacking of the revelations of Jesus Christ. We're unpacking the prophecy. Jesus is looking into the future as to what is about to take place here on earth. I don't know if there's any other book in the Bible that has more interpretations and more ways to look at it than the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation has so many different ways to, to, that people try to interpret it and look at it. There's a historical view there's a, a futuristic view you can look at it. There's, there's when, when Jesus sets up his kingdom, people say, is it going to happen before a rapture? So is it, are you pre-millennialist, uh, post-millennialist, amillennialism? All these different ways to look at the book of Revelation. And that's why it's so important that we ask God, continue to ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in our understanding of this book. So we are going to continue to dive into the meat of this book. Guys, we're in the main course. As a follower of Christ, the Bible talks about Drinking spiritual milk all the way up to eating meat. This is eating meat time, okay? We're, gonna, we're diving into it. I, I hope you guys have had a chance to dive into your Bibles. Every week I'm asking you to dive in and read with us because we're going to be moving fast. We're going to be covering a lot of material. And if you haven't read ahead of time, you might get lost in the dust. So continue to do that. Uh, join our midweek studies. Every week of this series, we're having a midweek Bible study to dive deeper because there's no way I can cover everything in Revelations in 30-minute sermons. Can't do it. So we have our midweek at 6 o'clock at our main campus. But hear this. Next week, we are not doing it. We won't, we won't do it this week because we have a wedding in the building. So we got to have a wedding. But the week after that, we'll start up. So, yeah, it will be, it will be, live. that's right. It will be, it will be filmed for you. So Pastor Luis is actually going to be filming it and send it out to you guys. So you have that. But do not show up at the building because nobody will be there, okay? So that's important. But continue to dive into the Word of God. That's why it's so important. You got to dive into this Word. I, I want to tell you that because this Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I you need to see how even in the book of Revelations, God is guiding us to a point. And let me show you where he's taking us. Go open your Bibles real quick. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Look at what this is saying. Revelation 21. Verse 1. Revelation in the back of your Bible, if you didn't know. <laughs> Revelation 21, verse 1 says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. Guys, everything you see right now will be gone. Everything. And the sea was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a beautiful bride dressed for her husband. I saw a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. God knows what you cry about. And there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more the things that we deal here with on earth. All these things will be gone forever. That's what we have to look forward to. That's right. Man, I'm telling you, that is so true. To, to think about what heaven's going to be like. No more of these issues we're dealing with. That's what the book of Revelation is, is guiding us to. It's guiding us to that point. It's amazing to think, to think about that. The, Re, the book of Revelation ends with a blessed hope. Guys, if there's nothing else you get out of this series, I want you to understand that one day you will be reunited with your loved ones who died believing in Jesus. We'll be reunited with our loved ones that we lost. 
All the issues that we deal with, that means no more pills, no more doctor visits. We'll, and all things will be made new. We'll have new bodies. These old knees and that old back pain you got, can't even get out of bed. Every, every morning you get up and you hear things cracking. You don't have to worry about that no more. New bodies, everything. That's right. Do you realize that? That's crazy. Like everything's going to be made new. All things. That's what we have to look forward to one day. It's amazing to think about. That's our blessed hope. I don't know about you guys, but there are people in this room and watching online who need to know that there's going to be a better tomorrow. There are people in this room and watching online who need to know that there's hope for the future. That they don't have to keep worrying about what's going on today. And the church in 95 AD also needed to have that same hope. We know that, that, that this book of Revelation was written by John in a vision given to churches that were being persecuted. Back in 95 AD, these, these seven churches that John wrote this letter to were, were having a deal with so much persecution from the Roman Empire. Rome was the controlling party at this point in time, and the church was being annihilated by Rome. Not just Rome, but by Jewish people who didn't believe in Jesus. If you followed Christ, guys, I'm telling you, if you followed Christ in 95 AD and you pledged allegiance to any other king but Caesar, your head would be chopped off. You'd be fed to lions. You'd be burned alive. Christians had to deal with this type of, of pressure. The Bible calls it uh, tribulation, the uh, philipsis. They had to deal with all this. Rome would allow you to worship your own God, but you better not say that there's another king. And the Christians worshiped another king named Jesus, and it caused them all kind of different persecution at this time. Many, Romans, many, many Roman cities, Christians, they would be killed for their, for their faith, burned at the stake. So many different things would happen. They died horrible deaths when the book of Revelation was written. So throughout this apocalyptic letter, Jesus is encouraging the church, stay faithful to me until I return. He says, stay faithful unto me until the day that I return. I know persecution is happening. I know problems are happening, but stay faithful to me because one day Jesus is going to crack that sky and come back in bodily form. The Bible says we're going to see Jesus. We're going to see him personally. Just like you see me, you're going to see Jesus in, in the flesh. And we're going to be resurrected one day. Back to new life. Now, through this book of Revelation, Jesus is telling the church, that he would one day not just make all things new, but he was going to bring catastrophic judgment on this earth. Jesus is saying he, he's going to bring judgment on a sinful world that rejected him. You can continue to reject Jesus all you want to right now. Go ahead. Maybe I don't believe all this church stuff, all this Jesus stuff, man, I ain't with it. That's fine. But let me tell you something. There's going to come a day where you will not have any more time left. There's going to come a day where the grace of God will run out. And judgment will come. Guys, if there's something else I want us to get out of this series, it's that not, not, God is not only a God that makes things new. He's also a God that brings justice. God will bring justice. He's a God who brings justice. When it seems like evil is winning, God will bring justice. Just like the, 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 the four living beings sing. They sing God is holy, 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 just like we just sung. God's holiness means he's a God of love, but he will also bring justice to those who have done wrong. The, the enemies of the church would be taken care of like Rome and the Jews who hated Jesus. God was going to take care of them because evil cannot last forever. God's plan was to take care of actually what's behind all the evil, and that's Satan and sin. God is going to one day do away with everything that's behind all this evil and deception for good. It is Satan and sin and will be done for good. I, <laughs> I watch a lot of Dateline. I don't know why. My family like, why are you watching some of Dateline? Why are you watching the real thing? Watching, you know, something else. But no, I, I like it. And Dateline has these, has these things called cold cases, right? If you watch Netflix, you understand that. There's these cold cases where somebody commits a crime or there's a murder and they can't find the criminal for years. There are thousands of cases right now where people were murdered and killed in the 60s and the 70s, and they still haven't found the murderer or the killer. There are crimes that have happened that have gone cold. But guys, I want to tell you something. Nothing is hidden from God. God sees everything. There is going to be a day where everything that happened behind closed doors will be uncovered. 
There's going to be a day where everything that happens uh, are behind the scenes in the dark will come to the light and it will be judged. That's a good thing. That's God's justice. Nothing gets past God. That's, that's why we read in chapter 5 of Revelations when the fifth seal was broken, the, the, the ones who died in Christ, they said, God, how long? How, how long until you avenge our death? And God says, how long? Not long. Like Dr. King said, not long, because no lie can live forever. Not long, he says, because justice will prevail. So there are events in, in, the, new, in the, uh, the book of Revelations of judgment that will lead up to Christ's return, and that is what we are reading about in the book of Revelation. We're reading about the events that have to take place because the Almighty God is about to pour out his judgment on the earth. The Bible calls it the day of the Lord. And justice will be served. I'm sure you guys watch uh, probably all kind of courtroom scenes on Netflix. And you see the, the bad guy. He finally gets, they've, they've, been, they've been chasing this guy through all the episodes that you've been binge watching. They finally catch him and they're in the court scene. And the judge hits the gavel. Guilty. It's the same thing God is going to do one day. To sin and Satan. Guilty. And it's all going to be washed away, made new. Guys, you serve a God of justice. And he's going to do the same thing. Now, at this point in the book of Revelation, John is continuing his vision of what he's seeing in the future. And last week, we saw how Jesus was given the scroll, and there were seven seals, and Jesus breaks all seven of them. Seven, and what does seven represent? What does it represent? Perfection. Completion. That's right. Perfection. Perfection. So this, the, these seven seals then open up seven more judgments. They open up seven angels with seven trumpets. We, see, we are seeing the complete perfect judgment of God being carried out. We're seeing this. Kind of like you know, one, of, one, of those, uh, one of those Russian dolls. As soon as you open one up, there's another one here and another one there. Each set of seven judgments brings another one. Open up your Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 8. Revelation 8 verse 1 says this. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about a half an hour. I saw the seven angels who sat before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. And thunder crashed and lightning flashed and there was a terrible earthquake. Man, what an amazing scene. The seventh seal is broken and unlocks seven angels who announce seven more judgments because these seven trumpets unlock and then unlock the seven bowls. So we, and we see here all these judgments are being poured out, and there's silence. There's silence in heaven because now we need to pay and move our attention to something that's very significant in what's about to happen. There's a pause here to show us what's about to take place in heaven. And an angel takes the prayers of the saints, mixes them with fire, and throws them down on earth, bringing thunder and earthquake. Now, what does that mean? What in the world does all that mean? When we see the prayers of God, we see this. What this means is God, God uh, his actions are moved by the prayers of God's people. God, let me tell you something. Prayer is very integral to your, to your life. Do not take prayer lightly. Prayer is not something you just do before you eat your meal. God hears your prayers. The Bible says God hears the prayers of his, of his people. The effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous availeth much, the Bible says. They have great power. God says, I hear your prayers. Literally, we're seeing what's happening with your prayers. God hears them. He hears the prayers of people who, are, who their prayers are lined up with his will. When you submit your life and your desires to the will of God and you pray, the Bible says God hears that. We are seeing heaven unlock things on earth because of prayer. It's amazing what's happening. And the people who are dying at this time during the great tribulation were praying to God for relief. The saints of God were praying to God for judgment against their loved ones who were killed because of their faith. But this also shows your prayers too. Now let me tell you something. Continue to pray. Pray for your family. Pray for your kids. Pray for your loved one. God hears it when you pray in his will. He's hearing it. It's what we're getting out of this. 
Scripture shows us that when we pray for what God wants and we give him our heart's desire, it, 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 it opens up what happens in earth. God, uh, Jesus told Peter, he said, Peter, because of what you said, because you see me as the Christ, I will give you the keys to the, king of, of the kingdom of God. And whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. And whatever you lock up on earth will be unlocked in heaven. He said, if you pray to me, heaven will take action. That is what we're seeing here. God is taking action mixed with the prayers of God's people to bring judgment on the earth. Guys, let me tell you, tell you, God hears your screams. He hears your heart's desire. He knows what's going on. And at just the right time, heaven will move. But here we are seeing judgment being poured out because of these prayers. The action of prayer kicks off the next first four trumpets. And the first angel blows his trumpet. And God, the Bible says, brings fire and hail mixed with blood on the earth. And one-third of the trees and the vegetations are eaten up. And, and then the second trumpet is blown. And then what looks like mountains of fire are thrown into the sea, and one-third of the water turns to blood, and sea creatures die, and ships are destroyed. The, the, the third trumpet blows, and what looks like a great star hits the, the, the rivers and the streams, and they turn bitter. They turn, they turn poisonous. And nobody can drink from it. And then, and then a fourth trumpet blows, and one-third of the sun and the moon and the stars are struck, and things become dark. What is happening here? We're seeing how God is bringing his judgment even on nature. God is bringing his judgment down, and it's, and it's affecting nature. I know people talk about climate change and what it is. I'm not saying it is or if it isn't. I'm just, that's not my discussion. But, guys, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a time where geologists and, and uh, scientists will be baffled by what's happening to our planet. There's going to be a time where we're not, we're not going to know what's happening, and it will not be because of pollution. It will be because of God's judgment. He's showing us this. He, he's showing us what's happening to the planet. Th this great time of tribulation, this great time of pressure and catastrophe is directly from God. God will be pouring out his judgment on a sinful world and its answer to people's prayers. God, now all this sounds awful. You're like, man, man God, why would God do all that? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> God, let me explain something to you. Do not confuse evil with justice. I'll say it again. Do not confuse bad and evil with justice. When somebody gets sentenced to prison for a crime they commit, that is not evil. That's called justice. When somebody gets acquitted of something that they did not do, when, when, when a, a bully gets sent, uh, gets expelled from school because he's been bullying your child, when, when you get into a car accident and the, the person has to pay out an insurance claim to pay you back, these things are not evil. This is justice. This is justice being played out. We've got to understand that. The holy judge who sits on the throne will take care of everything. And I don't know what's going on with you and your family. I don't know what's happening in your home where it feels like things are happening to you, but God will bring justice. Do you hear me when I hear what I'm saying to you? He'll bring justice. Can you imagine how this must have sounded to the church in 95 AD? To, to know that their loved ones had died. That they, they were hung, that they were, they, were, they were crucified upside down, they were, had their head chops off, but to hear that one day justice would come, their loved ones didn't die in vain. So important that we see that. Can you imagine the, the, the church, early church, people pacing the, the floor at 12 o'clock at night wondering, are they gonna be next? Is it gonna be their family next? Here God says this. Well, look what Paul says, because the church in Thessalonica dealt with the same thing. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'll read it so you don't have to turn there. It says this, verse 5. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide, don't we need this, rest. God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flames and fire, bringing judgment to those who do not know God and to those who refuse to obey the good news of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Paul is saying the same thing that John saw in the book of Revelations, that God will bring justice and that justice will give you rest. 
Man, don't some of us need some rest. God will give you the type of rest that eight hours of sleep could never give you. Rest for your soul, man. Man, that just sounds so good. Paul, Paul is say, saying the same thing that John said. That they won't have to continue to suffer because the day of the Lord was coming. And people will be running everywhere trying to run from God. But it will be too late because God will bring his justice. So important that we see that. And in all this, the church in Thessalonica was growing in their faith. In the middle of persecution, their faith was growing stronger in God. The Holy Spirit was empowering them. And God is saying the same thing to us today. Guys, live faithfully. Live with urgency. Stop taking life for granted. How many more funerals do you need to go to until you finally realize that I need to stop taking life for granted? Paul says, live with urgency. Know that if you don't die first, that someday God's going to crack that sky. So live with urgency. So important that we see that. God, and we see this now. We already see it being played out. Our world is moving more and more towards the wickedness that will bring God's judgment. That is why we do not love this world. We do not love this world. The hate, the greed, the murder, the jealousy, the, the, the thirst for pleasure at any cost. The deception we see with so many lies, we see it now. The Bible, the Bible actually says that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. The spirit of the beast is already at work. He's already been, been planting seeds. It's already been happening. We see it now. Let me show you the 2 Timothy chapter 3. You don't have to turn it off. I'm going to read it to you. It says this. You should know, Paul is writing to Timothy. He said, you should know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, very difficult times. For people will love themselves only and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander one another and have no self-control. They will be cruel and they, and they will hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious. Let me run that back. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. He said, in the last days, that's what you're going to see. And let me explain something to you. It's not just in our government. It's not just in the schools or anywhere else. He's saying you're going to see that in the church. Come on. Come on. He said, you're going to see these type of things unpacked in the church. Christians dividing and hating each other because of their political parties and racial backgrounds. Satan wants the church deceived and divided. Satan wants nothing more than to see the church deceived and divided and loving the world. That's what Satan wants. That's the deception that he wants. That is why Jesus will one day pour out his judgment like we're reading about right now, because people refuse to live by truth. Guys, it's amazing. We, instead of living by truth, we see people living by podcasts that sound like the truth. Nothing wrong with having a podcast, but man. You better be speaking the truth of God. We, we live in a, in a day where, 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 we, where people believe, instead of believing truth, we believe skewed opinions and not what God said. God, let me explain something to you. When you live by truth, you will not be popular with any af uh, uh, affiliation group. You will not, any group that is not grounded in the word of God, if you are a follower of Jesus, you will not be popular in. Let me tell you this. If you are a follower of Christ and you, and you will stand on his word, you will not be popular in every Republican corner. You will not be popular in every Democratic corner. If you are a follower of Christ, you will not be popular on campus at, on, at school all the time. If you are a follower of Christ, you, you will not be popular with every activist group. Why? Because truth is disruptive. Truth disrupts things. When you live by truth, you, you, and people don't live by truth, you can't be in it too long. It's, it's, it starts to create tension. There's another option. Guys, you got to understand this. Jesus was hated by the religious elites. He was hated by the Pharisees group. He was hated by the Sadducees group. He was hated by the Herodians. He was hated by all the religious elites and affiliate groups. Why? Because he stood on truth. And truth Hallelujah. disrupts people. Hallelujah. It's so important we see that, guys. It's okay if you don't fit in with every corner. There's another option. It's the truth of God's word. Amen. Guys, when we see all these things, Jesus did not live by anybody's agenda. 
And when agendas and hate and division and sin continue to run rampant, God is going to one day pour out his judgment. And people are going to be running saying, who can stand in this day of the Lord? Guess who's going to be able to stand? God's people. God's people. Now, let's quickly look at this. Let me get out of here, man, because it's getting hot up here. All right. <laughs> Let me get y'all out of here. All right. Now, let's look at this, okay? Jesus is about to pour out his judgment, and he's seeing all this, and we see the next three trumpets. This is very interesting because he makes a distinction. He says the first four trumpets are attacking nature. The next three, he says, are terrors. And we see, and, and, and an eagle flies over, and John sees, and his eagle says, terror. Terror, terror because of what's about to happen to those who love this world. I want to give you a quick disclaimer real real quick. The book of Revelation is not meant to give you the warm and fuzzies. Okay? The book of Revelation is not meant to give you, oh, that's so nice. No, no, no. It's meant to keep you grounded in the word of God. It's meant to keep you focused on what's about to happen. Jesus is showing us. He's showing us. It's supposed to shake us to open our eyes to to stay here. And the first terror, what happens, the Bible says the bottomless pit is opened. The abyss and these, these, these scorpion type things, these locusts start coming out by the millions and start stinging people. And, we, and these locusts are hideous. They have long hair, fangs, and they, have, they have eyes, of, of a, they have a face of a human, and they have tails that sting. And they're told to sting people to attack. And, and, and the Bible says their, their leader is an angel called, called the destroyer, and people are affected by these things. And it's attacking them mentally and spiritually. What we're seeing is, 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 is uh, uh, demonic oppression happening even more, being, being let loose and attacked. And the, next four, and the next trumpet we see after this is four angels. It doesn't, it doesn't get any better. I'm just telling you. Okay? We see four angels at, at the Euphrates River, and the Bible says they are let loose. And they have two million riders who are going out and destroying one-third of the earth. It's amazing to see. The tribulation time shows us who will be preserved during this time. Let me show you who's going to be preserved. Revelation chapter 9, verse 4 says this. They were told not to harm the grass, the plants, the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. God's people will be shielded from this type of judgment. The Bible says the people who have God's seal, the Holy Spirit, who, people who are numbered by God will be sealed. Just like with the, during the time of Passover when the blood of the Lamb was on the doorpost and death passed over, the Bible says those who are sealed by God will not be hit by this judgment. They'll be protected. It's important we see that. That's, that's what it means to be saved. When somebody says, man, I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus, it means you are saved from the coming judgment. You're saved from what's about to happen to this world. Like the blood of the lamb that covered the people, of, uh, the people of Israel, God will seal his people. At this point, John then sees a massive angel standing with a scroll in his hand. This is crazy. Check this out. He sees this guy with a scroll, and this angel gives John a scroll. And he says, eat the scroll. John puts some hot sauce on it, and he eats the thing. <laughs> it tastes good to him at first. It tastes really good. But then it turns sour in his stomach. What it shows is that the word of God, for some people, it's good. It's life. But to some people, this word of God stings your life. It's not for everybody. He shows us. Then we see two witnesses, the Bible says. And some people believe that these two witnesses are the church. Some people believe that these are actually two people. We're going to see at some point where there are going to be two witnesses for God who are going to have the power like Moses and Elijah to call down fire from heaven. And they're going to prophesy for three and a half years. And then what happens is the beast ends up killing them. And we'll talk about who the beast is next week in a couple weeks. But then these two witnesses end up being resurrected and the world is shocked because everybody hated them. And and they're resurrected back to God. And then the last trumpet is blown and it announces that that the world has now become the belongs to the Lord and to his Christ and they will reign forever. I don't know if you guys have been following the stuff that's happened in England. They just crowned King Charles or whatever. They just did all that. And they had all kinds of people singing and everything. But one day the real king is going to be on his throne. And he's going to reign. That's right. And we're going to behold, we're going to behold his glory. Can you imagine that? We're going to see that the king of kings and the lord of lords. And this is what happened. Last scripture. Revelation chapter 11, verse 16, says this. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshipped him. 
And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name, from the least to the greatest. It is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on this earth. Jesus now continues to bring his judgment on the earth and showing us how he is going to reign forever. Church, all of these events during this great tribulation show us that we need to stay faithful to God. In a broken, sinful, disgusting world, let me remind you, this world has nothing for you. This world has nothing. Everything you see one day will be gone. I know it doesn't sound good. Your house, your car, your your 401k, your business. Guys, I'm going to tell you one day it'll all be gone. But those who are standing on the word of God will have way more than they ever got in this earth. All those nights slaving and going to school and working and working two jobs and doing this. One day, you won't have to worry about none of it. It'll just be given to you. Why? Because you stay faithful. And that's what we have to look at. So important. Guys, I want us to remember this. Let's continue to hop into the word of God. Next week, read Revelation chapter 12. Do the homework. We're in the school, so do your homework, okay? (laughs) Read Revelation chapter 12. And next week, we're going to learn even more about what's happening as we unpack this word. Dive into the word of God so that the word of God can dive in you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for another day. God, I thank you for these people in this room and those watching online. God, I just ask that you, your Holy Spirit continue to make us grounded in your word. God, in a world that is filled with so much deception, so many little things that can, be, that can twist the truth, help us to stand firm on the truth of your word. Help us to never waver. God, when life gets hard and we get in the valley with our family, help us to never look back. Help us to move forward because the God who sits in heaven one day will make all things new. Not only that, God, we know we're going to bring, you're going to bring your judgment. God, help us to have this spur us on to continue to stay faithful to who you are and what you've done. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.